Hello, thank you for joining Breaking News with Media Leaders. I'm your host, Keontae Coleman. I can't wait to jump into the conversation today, so I'm going to go ahead and bring in our guest. You see him there. That is Dave Gorn, the Executive Director of National Sports Media Association. Dave, thank you for joining Breaking News with Media Leaders. Keontae, my pleasure. It's great to see you again. Great to see you. I want to start off the show with you telling us about how you got to where you are today. I like for the various leaders to come in to situate themselves for the audience so that they can get a feel for, all right, here are some things that I could do to possibly get to sit in Dave's seat one day. So tell us about your path. Well, well, as you well know, everybody's path is unique. And I started you know, basically as a sports craze kid playing every sport in the backyard or on the driveway or on our backyard ice hockey rink for four different winters. And when I found out you could actually earn a living by talking or writing about sports, that really appealed to me because I knew I probably wasn't going to be very tall. I didn't like to get hit. Uh, I didn't shoot very well in basketball didn't skate well enough in hockey, uh, couldn't hit a curveball. So how do I stay in sports? Well, I'm in high school and I find out that our local newspaper, and I grew up in a city of uh, close to 60,000, uh, the newspaper had high school kids writing as sports correspondents for the paper. So that's how I started. My, I was a 15 year old high school junior Got a job covering first my high school sports and then all area sports for the Taunton Daily Gazette newspaper in my hometown of Taunton, Massachusetts. And did that my two years in high school. Every break I had in college, I came home and did it. And then for a couple of years after I finished. Now, it was never full time, uh, but it was a great start in writing, obviously, and then getting to interview and get comfortable with interviewing people who are older than you that might intimidating, for lack of a better word. I go to Syracuse University. Uh, you may be familiar with that. And at the Newhouse School, not only do you learn from great professors, but at my time, freshman year, you walk into the school radio station. Now there are like two or three of them. And you start writing for an on-air person. Then gradually you get cleared to go on the air to do, I did news and sports. And then at that point, your peers had to clear you to do play-by-play, -play, which everybody wanted to do for football, basketball, lacrosse. And I didn't get cleared till my senior year. I think I did three football games and 10 basketball games. So now, and I've done plenty of sports casts, and uh, my junior year, we got the contract to do the AAA baseball team for the Toronto Blue Jays, the then Syracuse Chiefs. And my junior year, I stayed in Syracuse, did pre- and post-game shows. I think I did 13 games of play-by-play -play color before I graduated the next spring. So I get out, and I think, I've done major college sports and AAA baseball. I'm going to get a job right away. Well, I wanted to do TV sports is what I wanted to do. My demo reel coming out was, to be honest, not good enough. I did get four requests to send another tape off the resume and cover letter that I had to type individually. And I sent out more than 300, 225 TV and about 88 major market radio stations because you know I had all that great. Well, I ended up going home and substitute teaching for four years, still writing for my local paper. Um, worked for my hometown radio station, got a job finally at another radio station in Brockton, Massachusetts, about 20 minutes away. And now I'm out of school three years. I had run for mayor of my hometown the summer and fall after I graduated. Um, <laughs> great, great learning experience. Um, finished fourth out of five, and the woman who finished third blamed me for keeping her out of the, the runoff election. Anyway, uh, fast forward, I'm, I'm working at this radio station. I get myself a season press pass to cover Providence College basketball. And while I'm there one night, I go to the sports director at the NBC station for a game. And I said, look, I'm trying to get into TV sports. I'll work for free. Do you guys have any? And he said, I think the weekend guy needs somebody. So I call the weekend guy. He said, great, when can you start? Because for them, it's free help. And I had interned when I was in sports. I knew my way around TV station. 
And I started doing that February of 1984. I counted 1,100 hours for free over nine months that I put in, and I would do anything. Um, and then they hired me after those 1,100 hours for $5.45 an hour as a part-time associate producer in sports, and I thought I had just struck gold. And so you get in, and then I start. If I go out with a photographer, I'm going to shoot a stand-up, and I'm going to put a package together. And the, I finally accumulate all that. You know, the, the weekend guy went to bat for me with the news director. That's how I got hired. And he gradually let me do some reporting, did some live shots over the span of four years now. I had some full-time weeks, some part-time weeks. The weekend guy left to go to Boston. He got me in there as a fill-in sports producer at WCVB. So now I have media market and major market experience, but I wanted to do on-air stuff. And so April of 1984, I find out about a sports director job in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Never been to Winston-Salem, never really been out of the Northeast except for one trip, actually two trips. One was my senior year in college to do a two-game basketball road trip to Detroit and Illinois State. And the other was to go visit my sister who was then living in Santa Monica, California. I've never really been out of the Northeast. Apply for the sports director job, and I hear nothing for four months. Finally, in August of that year, now 1988, I'm sorry, 80, um, uh, yes, 1988, not 1984, um, I get this phone call from the news director at the TV station in Winston-Salem. Dave, I didn't feel you're ready for our sports director job that you applied for, but I have a number three sports opening. Would you be interested? I said, yes, long story short, I end up getting that start September 27th, 1988. The day I moved here was the day of the Dukakis Bush debate at Wake Forest. In so I couldn't even stay in the hotel that was for the Holiday Inn that was closest to the TV station. Uh, anyway, I started as a number three guy. They let me fill in anchor. Weekend guy leaves within eight months. I moved to the weekend spot. I do that for 12 years moved to weeknights, do seven years of weeknights. I'm there for 20 years, uh, as you well know, in the TV business, you work on weekends and nights and holidays because news is on all the time. Um, I get a, I, I anchor Thanksgiving night, 2008, have the next six days scheduled off. And on the fifth of those days, news director calls me at home and says, Dave, sorry to bother you. General manager wants to know if you'll come in and talk to me. I remember late 2008, Conway was in the dumper. You know, car sales were down. People weren't buying ads. Go in, the general manager says, Dave, as you know, your contract is up at the end of January. We're not going to renew it. Here's a little parting gift. Thanks for 20 years, Seal. Now, what do I do? 48 years old at the time. Um, fortunately, that little, here's a little gift for 20 years lasted me. The nine months I was out of work. Um, two months later, I get a form letter in the mail. Congratulations, you've been elected North Carolina Sportscaster of the Year. And what was then the National Sportscasters and Sports Writers Association based in Salisbury, North Carolina, 45 minutes from Winston. My wife said, sure, everybody else gets to fly across country to this big deal. We get to drive 45 minutes to Salisbury. While I'm there for the awards weekend, the three-day awards weekend, the local board president said, why don't you apply for our executive director job? It's open. My exact words to him were, I'm not sure what I want to do when I grow up yet. But as I mentioned, I was 48 years old at the time. And I say that because when you work in sports, no matter how hard you work or how many hours you work, it doesn't feel for most. I was 48 at the time, had two young boys that were going to be attending college in the next 10 years. Um, I thought it was a great way to stay involved in sports and sports media. My last four years in TV, I had done part of the Wake Forest football pregame show for home games. They asked me to be the sideline reporter for all the games. I started those two jobs the same week, September of 2009. I've been in this job now, so I guess it's my 13th season, as we say, in sports. Still on the Wake Forest radio crew as a sideline reporter, and I now taught a sportscasting class at Wake Forest last five falls. So that was a good, that was a Reader's Digest version of how it happened. That's basically it. Thank you for sharing. I want to circle back around on a couple of things there. One, the mayorship. How, 
how how did we get to <laughs> running for mayor? You know, despite doing sports, I've always been a news hound. I love news, and I love I love how things run, um, you know, civic affairs, and that part of it was well, I don't have a job that paid at the time like you know, well next to nothing for. Um, day, but it was a job and you know, I enjoy helping people and helping you have that civic pride and you want to, you want to help things. And it was great experience getting, you know, never mind being behind a microphone or in front of a TV camera where you're really just talking to one person. You have to get up and make speeches and answer questions that you're ad-libbing, which is great training for, for sports casting, certainly, and, and news as well. Um, and, and yeah, you know, I learned that the main re- thing I took away was people just didn't want you to take money out of their pockets, and you can have a long political discussion on that because sometimes you need to spend to take care of things. But anyway, that was uh, it was interesting. <laughs> I'm glad cool. I did. It. I I can't say during our conversations that running for mayor ever has come up before so that's that was a new one for me often, it doesn't often come up <laughs> the other is one piece of this show is talking about the pivot how we pivot from you know doing one thing to the next so in your career you pivoted from hey, I don't have anything and I'm willing to work for free to, hey, I'm I'm doing this in the Northeast where I'm close to home and now there's something down in North Carolina I've never been, you know, and willing to go in, you know, you apply for the higher job and they're saying, no, we have this. Talk about what it takes to make those pivots. What what stands out to you to make that something that's going to be successful? Probably getting out of your comfort zone. And I was willing when I grew, left college to go anywhere for a job. Um, then I go back home and, you know, you grow up a fan of your Boston teams, you know, Red Sox, Patriots, Celtics, Bruins, and you, you're covering those teams. And then you get really comfortable there because you're, you know, I grew up 16 miles from Providence where, spent those four years. So I was comfortable. I knew people. Um, I was half an hour from home at most. Um, but but if you want to do what you want to do, that was actually a piece of advice that I got my senior year in college at Syracuse. I had a programming professor who had won several Emmy Awards and he's, his, his tease to get you to come to class on the last day, because I don't think we had a final, but we had a final paper. His tease was, on the last day, I'm going to tell you the key to life. And for him, the key to life was do what you want to do. And obviously, there are always mitigating factors to that. Um, but if you really want to do something, you will do whatever is So mine was leaving the comfort of home, going to a place where I'd never been. I mean, millions of people do that. So it's not unusual. Um, you know, you are you are increasing your odds, increasing your chances of getting a job if you are open to more geography than just where you grew up. Right. What have you found to be the question that you get asked the most by students wanting to jump into this field? Do you have any jobs? that I can have, <laughs> that's usually, and you know, we, we, that, were all naive. we were all naive as 21, 22 year olds, right? How, how does it work? And that's, you know, that's one of the things I have realized over the years is it's incumbent upon us to maybe explain how it works. So in my, in my sports casting class, I've tried to bring in guest lecturers who tell all about the different parts of sports casting. So you can be a play-by-play person. You can be a, an analyst. You can be a reporter. You can be an investigative reporter. Um, you know, you can do play-by-play. You can do a talk show. You can be a host. So there are different facets. So I've tried to bring in people who have done those jobs, as well as a news director who says, "This is what I look for in TV sports person." 
Um, I brought in the C CEO and founder of a HSRN, Heritage Sports Radio Network, broadcasts HBCU games. He, he started the company because he had that idea. So there's the entrepreneurial uh, aspect of it. So, um, so that's, you, know, you, you kind of have to explain to people who don't know what it's like, what it's like. And if somebody, again, I'll go back to my education at Syracuse. I had a professor who, who taught our, our news class, perform, news performance class. Um, he said, you know, learn how to do it so that when you get into the business, then you can do it the way you want. And that made perfect sense. It was really clear. Um, but, but I think, you know, I, I get asked a lot, how do I go about getting or what should I do to make myself better? You know, the answers are, are to me, obvious. Keep doing it. Keep doing what you do. You know, the technology has given us now, wasn't there when I was coming up. And my, my son, who is now 21 years old, when he was 10 years old, he did a sports talk show on his laptop because he could, I couldn't do that when I was 10 or 21 for that matter. The internet has given so many tools. Um, LinkedIn, that became like a game to me. And you can make connections. The important thing is make it so it's give and take, not you're just taking. But you know, between emailing people, you can make first contacts where before, you know, in our day, you had to pick up the phone and call somebody and odds are good, they wouldn't pick, up, pick up the phone. There'd be screening process. So you can at least make the attempt and, and get things out there to get that ball started. Yeah, I, I think that's a real big piece of this. And honestly, that's a huge reason for this show. Um, I, I'm someone who's all about sharing information and knowledge, and I devote a good bit of what I talk to my students about with career stuff. Like, here's what you need to know. Here's what they're looking for, that type of thing. So I, I appreciate you, and I appreciate your organization for doing it because I know at MTSU we have a student chapter, and they really do dive into your site. They dive into... Uh, some of the promotional things that you all have sent out to, uh, I said promotional, educational things that you have all sent out. Um, so I, it's it's not falling on deaf ears. It's, it really is appreciated. And, and you wonder sometimes, and we've had, you know, we've had, I've had conversations with faculty reps of student chapters on you know, the cost of our student membership, $45 a year. And I remember when I was 21, $45 was a lot. Um, and, and I've had somebody tell me, well, you know, some of our students that do the choice between that and a tank of gas, or now it's a half a tank of gas. Um, the way I look at it, it, it's an investment in your career. And I don't know that whether what I was, when I was 21 years old, I was mature enough to look at it that way. Um, but I think we provide so much. You know, so our awards weekend is now less than four weeks away. And we added a, a half day to our Sports Media Convergence Summit, which is basically a day and a half now of this. This would be established professionals conducting panels and seminars on different topics that are educational and I think worthwhile to anybody who attends. So, um, and it's been really gratifying to me to ask every single person I've asked, we, will you do one of these panels or seminars? No one's ever said no. And I've been doing this for 13 years. We will have four, 16 of these seminars and panels over the day. Um, and, and sometimes it's two or three or four on a panel. So it, it's been really gratifying to see these people are all, who are mostly award winners, some of them Hall of Famers. Curry Kirkpatrick, who I grew up reading in Sports Illustrated, who could turn a phrase with the best of them, said, texted me last night, happy to do a presentation during the, the summit. Um, Bob Ryan, Jackie McMullen. And Marv Albert, I remember the year he went in the Hall of Fame, he 
he called me up. He said, now what time do I need to get there so I can do one of these seminars? Like, Marv Albert? <laughs> saying, when do I need to be there? I mean, that's awesome. You absolutely love to hear that. Like, it, it's great, you know? Uh, and students always light up when you bring the speakers in. So I, yeah, I, I think that's a no brainer. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we just had our last one in December because we had kept postponing because of COVID. You know, Bill Roden, who, New York Times, he did a, a seminar and have a, a person of color, I'm obviously not, but have, I bet we had eight, eight students of color there and a couple professors. But well, what does that mean to them to see a Bill Roden, New York Times, talking to them in what, what was basically a small group and then have the opportunity when he was done with the formal presentation to go and just chat with them? I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's big time. That's big time. I, um, I had the opportunity when I was in undergrad at Jackson State to go to the National Association of Black Journalists uh, convention in Orlando. And I went to the sports task force uh, breakfast and sat down next to Stuart Scott, David Aldrich. Um, ah, it was somebody else. Uh, Michael Eves. He was at Memphis now, but he's at Sports Center now. And they're treating me like I'm one of them. And it was the absolute coolest thing that I hold on to till to till this day. Uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, those those types of opportunities are priceless. Absolutely. Can you explain your role for us? What do you do as the executive director? That's where I answer the question with a question, what don't I do? <laughs> I, am, I am the only employee of the organization. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. So here I come, TV sports guy, to take this job with no business experience whatsoever. Talk about a steep learning curve. So what can you and can't you do as a nonprofit? Well, I'll, I'll give you five bullet points, four bullet points, my main job. One is fundraising because the doors don't open and we can't put on this awards weekend without a lot of money. Marketing, you have to get the word out or else nobody knows about it. Um, membership, so how do you increase membership? How do, how do you explain to a student that $45 for a year is well worth the investment? Um, and then community, you get out in the community and talk to people so they know that you're there. So those things have been all things that I've had to learn. And then doing, doing the business part of the business every week, doing accounts payable and deposits, hoping that we have them and sending those to our bookkeeper slash account uh, and taking care of all those other regulatory and administrative things. Uh, so it's a lot of work, but I enjoy it. And uh, to those of us who have, been in sports all our lives. I think we all enjoy challenges, and it's a, it's, it's a great challenge every year to raise the money to put this thing on. And now imagine coming off an awards weekend six months ago and having to have that short turnaround to raise it for this year. So I'm hoping we're going to get there by the time this thing rolls around in four weeks. Out of those different duties that you just laid out, how would you say that your previous career has informed how you approach those? Great question. And it's funny because I think many of us, when we come out of that business, think that's all we can do. And the truth is that the skills in communications, communication skills, translate to just about any job out there. Um, I, one of the things I used to laugh at when I was well, I still do. When I got in this business, people in the, <clears throat> excuse me, business world can't write well. Uh, and that's something that we were under deadline pressure to write. And that's the other thing, deadlines. Now, our deadlines were twice a day, every day. 
six and eleven o'clock for just a, um, some people. Here's a project. Get it to me in two weeks. Okay. Like right now, I have to get my a printed program and a copy of it somewhere. Such a mess. I don't have one. Sarah back there. Is there a program there? You can hold up right there on the edge of the page. That's Sarah, my intern, by the way. So that's, I think we're looking at a 70, thank you. That's like a 76 page program that, that's one of my jobs, but I have help. Um, but I have to get that to the printer this by this Friday. So we're in the process of proofing all those pages, making sure everything's right, it's laid out right, it looks good, the information's correct. Uh, you know, there's still pages I haven't produced yet. That'll be the rest of this week. Um, so those are those are all the things that go into it. Selling ads for this for the first <laughs> year and a little show and tell here. Pull out. Right, come on. My first year doing this job, and, and I I worked with a woman who uh her mother had worked with the organization for 42 years. This was my first year working here. And as you see, all black and white, except for the cover. After I had, and I didn't have much to do with it because she had done that before, the layout. And there were maybe six or eight pages of ads, all for the national and Hall of, national winners and Hall of Fame. Keep in mind, we have 100 plus state winners. And I said, well, what? What would happen if we sold ads to the employers of the state winners, congratulating them for winning their awards? Well, we went from probably six or eight thousand. Well, we went to color printing the next year because we we bid it out and it turned out it wasn't that much more to make up for that. I, I said, let's sell to the, the state winners' employers, and so that's a lot of work. So imagine. So this year we have 115 winners. And I have a database of all their information. And then I was smart enough this year to remember the very first questionnaire I sent to the winners, who can we approach to sell ads? And mm. your state or your newspaper or whatever. So those emails go out pretty much individually to station management, news directors, sports editors, uh, program directors. Uh, and, and that's, I, I probably send out 250 of them. And so the first year I did it, we went from six or eight thousand dollars in revenue, twenty-one to twenty-seven. To set a record this year, forty-four thousand five hundred dollars in revenue. And you know, so wow. every once in a while, the light bulb will go off. Every once in a while, um, but that's that's it's something that you know, learning this job by the seat of my pants is kind of what come up with ideas, think, think out. You know, everyone says think outside the box, do that. Think inside the box too, though. Yeah, but don't don't throw those ideas out. But you know that was an outside the box, outside the box thought that has basically netted us thirty thousand dollars a year toward our about eight or ten percent of our annual budget. Pretty good chunk. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it seems helpful. Yes. <laughs> Every little bit helps. What advice would you give to, and you've already hit on this a little bit, but what advice would you give to those students that are just coming into the major? So there may be a freshman, they may be a sophomore, and they decided I want to go into sports, and they got a couple of years left in college, what's some advice you would give to them to help them build that portfolio before they get out? First and most important, listen to your professor. Um, say that mostly serious. Most important thing is do the work outside the classroom. There is, as I said, technology now gives you no excuse not to have experience by the time you walk out or walk across the stage and get, or get it in the mail if you go to a game. Um, do, do, do. So I kind of distilled um, my advice to three points. Read, 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 write, 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 and network your behind off. 
those would be those would be the things that'll get you a job. So reading informs your writing, right? So the more you can read, the better off you're going to be. Um, writing is reps. Rep, it's just as if you were the quarterback for a football team. The more reps you get, the more comfortable you'll be, the better you'll be. Experiment with your writing, be different. Uh, learn broadcast style if you're going into sportscasting. Get that right. I always, people laughed at Joe Piscopo when he was on Saturday Night Live when he was a loud sports guy and no verbs at all. Red Sox, one, Yankees, nothing. Wow. That's good. You're, that's giving the information and doing it in an entertaining way. Um, and, and then networking. I was the anti networker. I just wanted to do my job straight ahead and not worry about all the extraneous stuff. Because I thought that good at what I do, people will watch me. And that may, might be true to a certain extent, but think of yourself as put yourself in the viewer's shoes. Why do you watch somebody? And when I left the station in Winston Salem after 20 years, people say, "Oh, you were so good." Why? Do they, it's like, why do they say that? Because they got comfortable with me after 20 years. Imagine seeing somebody, an average of four or five days a week, every week for 20 years. You're going to get unless, unless the person's awful, you're going to get comfortable. And even if they are, you'll still get comfortable with them for the most part. And so, you know, I find the 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 idea of talent kind of nebulous. You can have talent, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're good. If that makes sense. Um, but meeting people, so you know, the more people you meet, the bigger your network. And you don't know when that network is going to come through for you, help you. Uh, I talked about starting with the weekend sports guy in Providence who went to Boston. He got me in there as a fill-in sports producer on a per diem basis. Basically, I talked to the sports director who was not on the air. He was the head sports producer, basically. And um, having the phone conversation with him for the first time, I said, you know, do you need a resume and a list of references? He said, no, Jack says you're good, you're good. I'll call you when I'm So, you know, get in and show what you can do. Um, but every, every single person has a good story. If you are a good journalist, you'll find you'll be able to tell that story. So learn how to ask good questions, learn how to put it all together. Um, you know, in TV, most people, maybe even up in to the top 10 markets, edit their own video, learn it, learn how to enjoy putting that puzzle together. Um, but those, I mean, the big ones, read, write, and and bottom line is, told many young people this, you can tell a company that you can help them make money, you will get hired and you will keep your job. You do it. That's the bottom line. I think that's very sound advice. When you are uh, talking with those students that are seniors getting out, what are some of the tips that you've heard now since you bring in so many different speakers and all those things and your own experience? What are those things that are going to make them pop when we're talking about trying to land some of these sports jobs? Because even though the sports market has expanded, it's still kind of a finite area. What are the things uh, that that helps them stand out. Yeah, I found there's a lot more turnover. Be yourself is, is the most important thing, I think. Um, everybody tells stories differently. There is a style, talk about broadcast style, and Joe Piscopo. Um, but find, find interesting ways to tell stories. And you know, I, I look at so many demo reels, and you know, I'll get them in their two minutes worth of me on TV, a, a, a stand-up montage, if you will, of stand-up out. It's like, I'll see two or three. I know what you look like and sound like. That, to me, is good enough. I, I always tell people, put your best reporter package first. I want to know that you can tell a good story. If you hook me with one good story, I'm in. 
So find a way. And that was my problem I, I said earlier in the conversation. When I graduated from Syracuse, my demo reel was not good enough. Make it good enough. Make it, make it better than good enough. You know, you have, you have the opportunity now, again, with technology to grow up being a storyteller with video. You know, to be all end all right here, you can shoot. I have my, my students shoot most of their packages on their phone. You can do that. You can learn. You, Edit software is now very cheap, reasonable, and in many cases free if you get it through your school. So there's no reason. Just do it. Again, I'll go back to my younger son. How many years ago was this? When did we shut down for COVID? 2020, March. He's, he's, he's volunteering working at the ACC basketball tournament in Greensboro, North Carolina with me. And we shut the tournament down on Thursday. We go home. Two days later, he comes downstairs in his pajamas after sleeping until 1230. That's what college age kids do. And he sits down with his laptop, and I didn't realize he was doing this, but he put together a one shining moment. That's the, the crescendo to the NCAA Final Four after the championship has been won. He put, put together his own with video from conference tournaments that had been played and regular season game so he used the music and edited <clears throat> excuse me his own highlights to it last time i checked he had like eighty thousand views on youtube for that oh wow and, and he did it in three hours the other guy I, I never taught him how to edit despite the fact that I did it all my career <laughs> did a really good job and you know he got it he got it into the hands of the right people thanks to social media so again there's you know Use social media for the good things it's meant to be. Um, you know, market yourself. LinkedIn's a great tool. I mentioned it earlier. You can you, know, you can build a Twitter following. You can build it on Instagram, Facebook, whatever, whatever platform or all of them. And that kind of drives me nuts that I have to be on. Um, that's how you. That's today. That's how you get the word out. You have to sell yourself. I, I would say don't go overboard on the sales part of it unless you have that good foundation to back it up. So that storytelling. Thank you. Moving on to our early career professionals. They've landed the job. They've been in it for a year, two, maybe three but they're in some of these places far flung, well, way away from home. And it might not be exactly what they thought it was going to be because they thought they were gonna cover the Red Sox right out of school. They thought they were gonna be, you know, in the locker room with Tom Brady with the Patriots or now the Bucks. How can you help them stay encouraged to keep going? Part of it is, honestly, if you find out it's not the right thing for you, you might want to think about something else to do. Um, if it's place, strictly place, then you know, make it your, your mission to get that demo reel out for your clip files. Um, and, and, you know, some people are comfortable in a spot. They, they move to a place they've never... And I, I thought I was coming to Winston-Salem, North Carolina for one two-year contract. 33 years later, I'm still here. And I like living here. Now, if you don't like a place, then, then it's up to you to get out. So get your best work together and start hitting every news director if you're in TV or program director if you're in radio or sports editor if you're a newspaper slash digital writer. Get it out there. Post it on social media and then make sure you grow your social media following. Because again, network, the network, the, the bigger it gets, the better chance you're going to have uh, that somebody's going to say, oh, know that guy and he's good and that woman and I'm going to hire that person. Uh, my first year teaching a college class was at High Point University and I had back to back guest lectures came in and said the same thing. It's become the mantra. 
we always heard it from our parents. What is it? It's not what you know, it's who you know, right? They took it one step further. It's not what you know, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. Mm. How do how do you get people to know you? You gotta get your stuff out there. Have to make connections, you have to know. Yeah, I like that one. I have to add that one in there. <laughs> the mantra. Who knows you? When you are, and you just brought it up, so it's a nice segue. For those professionals who may be thinking about doing a pivot, they've been in it for a while, and they're thinking about other avenues that they could go to next. Teaching could be one of those, going into more uh, I, I see folks going into more the public relations side of things uh, or just completely out of the business altogether. What did you find helped you kind of pivot into the teaching aspect of things? Teaching was funny because I, I did not go after either of the teaching opportunities. And that's the one good one of the good things about being a on the air in one place for 20 years is that people know who you are and even if they're not sports fans you know i'd be out at a restaurant somewhere you look really familiar used to you, you see, my mother used to love it when she would you know, my dad would come down and visit and we'd go to the mall because she would see the looks that people would give after they passed by um but that can play to your advantage obviously if you're trying to get a job in a different um in a different category or a different career um people know who you are so that's an advantage um now they have had to have spent 20 years in one market as i did but um you know i i, I had the i think it, it started the, the teaching part because i went to high point university to try to start a student chapter and went and did an information session and the faculty rep a couple months later said, hey, would you meet me for dinner or lunch or coffee or whatever? And at that meeting said, one, one of the things he said, would you be interested in teaching a class? And uh, I said, yes, let's start it. I, you know, I do not have an advanced degree, but 24 years doing what I did, do the business pretty well. And you know, then after that one year, they decided they wanted advanced degrees from their faculty because they were trying to get credited so was not asked back to teach there and wake forest a couple years later came and asked me to teach. and that as i said so it'll be my sixth fall semester doing that um so it's you know i, th I think once you've spent a lot of time in a career you you should have built up a repository of skills Again, going back to what skills do you translate from doing what we do to other careers? You have communication skills that are better than 80 to 90% of the, the general working public. So use those skills to your benefit and to your advantage. Were there any surprises for you when you started teaching? Like things that you just you're like, oh, didn't realize that, or you had to get used to doing certain things. Grading is the most monotonous activity known to man. Um, and it's subjective. So, you know, I personally, first day of class, I tell people you should have, you should have realized by now that grading is subjective because in my classes, I don't give tests or quizzes. It's performance. So I'm grading you subjectively. So, so I think the workload for teaching surprised me a little bit, which made me really glad that just taught one course in the fall only. And the reason I don't do it in the spring is because we spend so much time getting ready for our awards weekend. I don't think it'd be fair to myself or to the students to, to do that. And I found that out last fall because we had postponed our awards weekend. As I said, we had it in December. So 
Now I'm getting ready for finals and, and now I'm in a time crunch to get all my ducks in a row for the awards weekend. I don't know that I want to go through that again. And there's my other job as sideline reporter for Wake Forest football and radio. And that's in the fall. And they made it to the ACC championship game and the bowl games. I had two extra games. Mm. So once the regular season ended Thanksgiving weekend, I couldn't say I'm done. We're playing next Saturday. Then we're playing again in three weeks a month. So my management skills became top of mind. Gotcha. Yeah. I, and I, I think that type of information is helpful um, because I try to share those types of things with colleagues when they ask me about, you know, making the switch because the, the misnomer out there is we don't work. <laughs> like, and, 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 and and I've developed quite the respect for people who teach multiple classes. Because by the time you get to a second class, that's pretty much a full-time job. I teach three or four, because now you're dealing with, depending on your class size, 50 to 75 to 100 students. Like, you know, head coaches of football teams who have 100 players, they now have like 12 assistant coaches. As a professor, you might have a TA. I don't. Um, but so you're dealing with those people by yourself and all of the um, things incumbent, um, incumbent upon you with that job. Good information. Good information. Is there something about the leadership role I'm going to, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. The leadership role that you had as the sports director, if you could go back and kind of talk about those responsibilities and what that meant for you in the market that you were in and maybe how that compares to being a sports director in a market that's smaller than Winston-Salem and one that's uh, bigger than. I think the, the smaller markets, you do everything, including shooting your own video, editing your own video, writing your own scripts, and performing. Um, I was fortunate for the most part in my job, I didn't shoot. I shot a handful of times. If there were no photographers available, I needed excuse me, to shoot. Um, but I enjoyed all the other parts. And I would, you know, the beauty of, being in that role is, you know, when I went to shoot the first time, I knew exactly what I wanted to shoot because you have it in your mind's eye what you're looking for. Doing all those jobs give you, gives you an appreciation of what maybe those single career jobs people do. So I think it's important in this job, we move things around from place to place. I don't just tell people you move that. I help. I think it's incumbent upon me to show that no no job is too small or too big for me. Um, and it's funny because when you talk about leadership, I never really think of myself that way. Yet I know that my skills and my experience have contributed to make me one, um, if that makes sense. And so. You know, as you go up that ladder, you're going from doing everything to maybe medium market doing most of those things, get to a top 10 market. Now you're just, you're just the guy on TV. So you have to, so you have to think about that. And how do I spend my time being the best I can be at all these different jobs? Or by the time I get to be the guy, how do I get to be the best I can be on my face on TV? And even, even the top 10 markets, most of those guys now write their own content. Um, you might not be editing, especially if you're in a union shop, if you still exist anywhere in, in TV business. Um, I've been around all that and, and understand it. Um, so, you know, you have to prepare yourself the best you can for each of those jobs. And obviously, when you're the, the young, put upon 
person in the, the small market and you're doing everything and you, you don't think you're doing anything well, the reality is you are learning what you do best. Um, what, if you may, don't like shooting, you better learn to like it at least a little bit because you want to be as good as you can be at each of them. And yeah. I think when you when you have that attitude, I think people look at you as a leader. Have you found that uh, now that you've taken on this executive director role, do you look at any of the ways that you've interacted with leaders in your past and you've either taken on some of the things that how some of your previous leaders were or you've been I know not to do X, Y, and Z or whatever the case. Well, I think you're smart in your life if you look at it that way. It's like, as I mentioned, in your year in college, the professor said, do what you want to do. What does that mean? If I want to be a TV sports guy, but, you know, for three and a half years, I was living at home and I could get a job in the business. So now I had to, I don't think I even mentioned, I substitute taught for, um, did I want to do that? But I, look, I now look back and say, well, that was kind of a good foundation for the teaching I'm at. Not the same, but learn how to deal with students and give take and all that. Um, but yeah, I'm, there are things that I'd mostly how how people treat other people is what I've learned. I think I, I worked with one person who I didn't think treated people he worked with very well, and so I always try to trying to, to do that. Um, and my feeling was, well, if I'm the on-air TV sports guy and I depend on this person to push the button to play that video and that person to focus so I look good and that person on audio to make me sound good, the director to make sure they hit the cues right and the producer to make sure that I get in and out on time. I'm depending on all those people. I darn well better treat them well. And you know, when I left Providence, I thought that I could afford it. I left, I sent two seventy back in the day now, the 1980s, two seventy-five dollar fruit basket for the photographers and all the behind the scenes people as a way to let them know that I appreciated how they helped me. And, you know, can't say thank you enough to people with whom you work. Um, you know, buy a lunch or a dinner or a drink or a coffee every now and then. You know, just uh, it, it's a way to let them know that you appreciate them. Hopefully that everything's give and take. Um, you're going to need more from them one day than they'll need from you. And then the next day it might be different. So realize that, deal with it as an adult. And as somebody, many people have said, it doesn't cost you anything to be nice to me. I definitely believe that one. <laughs> I want to get your thoughts, and I see that it's something that uh, you all approached uh, with the organization. And talking about DEI and what that looks like with the National Sports Media Association, I was looking through uh, one of your clips online, and you all were, uh, you had a PowerPoint where you were breaking down what the awards look like and the membership look like at a certain time and how it's starting to change. So kind of talk about the efforts that you all are making as far as uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion with the yeah, well, National Sports Media Association. You know, when I first started, I, I looked at this program and said, wow, there sure are a lot of 50 and 60 year old white guys. In and my thing has always been just keep an open mind Try to help you. So, first thing I did and was let's start the Big House Gains College Basketball Coach of the Year Award. And it goes to a Division One and a Division Two head coach every year that are typically under recognized. So, it's typically a person of color. Um, we do women's coaches in Division Two. We do, we try to do an HBCU coach and addition to a, and sometimes that is the Division One head coach. 
um, but some, sometimes it's not. So, you know, Don Staley at South Carolina has won it. Uh, you know, this year Hubert Davis at North Carolina is the Division One winner. Janice Washington at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, Division Two winner. So that was the first thing, and then you know, it, it's still kind of inside. It bothers you that well, maybe it shouldn't be people outside the industry directly helping people in. And I pretend to know every answer. Oh, sometimes I probably do. Um, but I ha I've had a couple comments over the years. Like my, we put out the Hall of Fame list for a year. Boy, that's a diverse, you know, and I couldn't tell whether they were being honest or they were sticking it to us with a little sarcasm. And here's what I do anytime somebody does that. I would love to have your help in making it better. And the people who step up to the plate and put their money where their mouth is, I love those people. So what we did last January, so a year ago, January 2021, we formed a committee um, because I had enough people say, I'll help. So Wes Durham, who's now our board chair, was the chair of this committee, 13 people on it. What do we do? And Thing that really struck me, you talked about NABJ, and I know big in NABJ, in a NABJ sports, is Gary Washburn of the Boston Globe, who said, you know, some people have won this thing, this these state awards 13 times, and they don't even look at the award, they throw it away in a drawer. Just being a finalist for that award is something you can put on your resume. That means so that kind of stuck with me. What we did was we said, all right, we will have more finalists that have typically was in the states it's top two plus tie so most of those it's a versus b for the award typically that's going to be white person typically you put five finalists for each of those categories on the ballot with input from this committee on who those finalists should be so we took the top two normally from our general voting our membership and then added people with input from this. Well, you look at that list of five now, it's like, you know, I didn't I didn't even think about Keonta. He is so good, I'm gonna vote for him. And so when we have typically had a handful of either people of color or women, this this year, people we're going to be uh, honoring in three and a half weeks, I believe it's eleven and twelve. So step one, you've doubled, at least doubled, if not tripled, those numbers of women. And we said, let's add some awards because there are some blind spots, maybe. Like people who are in their 20s and maybe 30s don't feel they can ever win. Now, somebody like me will say, well, do what I did to pay your dues. I won an award, I was 48. Um, but there are good people because Back to the technology and my my younger son who when he was 10 years old did a sports talk show on his laptop you can be better and more poised at a younger age people i mean there's some tremendous writers out there because there are more avenues to get your stuff out there so we added an under 30 we we ended up i think 11 or 12 new awards financially we couldn't support all of them this year so we started with four. under 30 sideline reporter that typically will get left out of sports caster of the year, um, sports book of the year, sports documentary, <clears throat> excuse me. So those four awards, we will do the same night as our Rune Arledge Award um, winner. And our young reporter award happens to be a uh, person of color. Um, sideline reporter, Tracy Wolfson from CBS. Then documentary was actually Turner Sports is on there inside the NBA called an inside story, and then uh, Seth Wickersham who wrote Better to Be Feared about Tom Brady, Bill Belichick, and Robert Kraft and made them so successful. So that's step one. What you can't do is get complacent and say, okay, we've done all we can, do. because it's important. More and more women getting into the business, more people of color are getting into. The that's the reality. Um, some of it will be, I, I think, my personal opinion, some of it time will take care of. 
I think you will see more and more both those categories. And I hate talking about people as categories. I think more women and more people of color will start winning our national awards and go into our Hall of Fame. You know, our first person of color was in the Hall of Fame with Sam Lacia in 2015. Since then, Brian Gumbel, um, Leslie Visser, no, without remembering all of them individually. Stuart Scott this year, uh, Jackie McMullen this year, two of our, so there's 50% of our Hall of Fame. Um, and, and I see people in the pipeline. So I think it, it'll become more commonplace. Now, if I am a young person of color or a young woman, I say it doesn't happen fast enough. So that's where I think that's where the discussion happens. And you have to be an adult, the adult in the room always, I think, and, and just discuss it as rationally as possible while realizing that emotion is a component of that. And so is there a right answer, a wrong answer? There may not be a right answer, but there probably is a wrong. That's how I look at I would say that as someone who teaches about DEI in the media, someone who does research in this space, what you said goes on the path of we're trying to fix this. And that's what you got to do. So I, I think from what I just heard you say and from the video that I watched, those are the things that show. <laughs> it's not just talk. It, it, there are results that come from doing that. And I, I would say that it would be appreciated. Uh, that, and that's, I think, in my, in my view, sometimes, I, I think I've taken maybe to this point where you have to be intentional about it. Um, and there, there may be uncomfortable conversations, some of which we've had. And it's not easy to hear that because I think of myself as somebody who's always been open-minded. I don't. Um, I don't discriminate, I don't have a bias, but you're a product of how you were brought up, where you were brought up, um, and sometimes those can creep in. They're subconscious or unconscious biases. You have to be an adult and deal with them. It's not, um, it shouldn't be anything that you should be afraid of doing. And that's, a, you know, I've told many people, talk about being fortunate in your career, if I didn't do what I did as a local TV sportscaster, would I have ever crossed U.S. Route 52, kind of the dividing line, as you know, Keontae, in Winston-Salem between white Winston-Salem and black winston -Salem. If I weren't on that other side covering sports, would I ever experience it? I would like to say yes, but to be honest, probably not. Um, but here's what I, one of the things, a valuable lesson I learned is that People are afraid of what they do. So get to know other people. And that's, that goes to networking, the conversation we had before. Um, you know, it still bothers me that in the neighborhood in which I live, there are a few people. How do you, how do you fix that? There's a, there's a conversation for another day. <laughs> we, we won't tackle that here today. <laughs> But no, I, I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, and I, I would hope that uh, those watching um, and wanting to get into the sports world will give you all a nod, look at the programming coming up, and I'll allow you to kind of break that news for us. Uh, I always ask my guests to break some news for us, and that can be about them, that can be about their organization. So I'll give the floor to you to break some news for us. So our 62nd awards weekend, and this is the rebranding part, and national convention in Winston-Salem, June 25th, 26th, and 27th. It's a three-day weekend. You start with a welcome reception and dinner on Saturday. 
going back to the networking part, there are after parties every night. And that's so younger people especially can talk to established veterans in a, in a laid back setting. Um, I mean, it's just great to have 100 plus sports media all together with no deadlines, you know, whether it's back slapping or sharing stories or saying, hey, I, I tried this, why don't you try that? You know, here's here's what my spotting chart looks like. Maybe you would want to do that. Here's how I like to keep play by play, or, or just listening to Hall of Famers tell stories. Um, it, it's all it, it, that's awesome. We'll have a sports trivia contest that will will benefit some charity. The our opening night at the end of dinner Sunday, we do we'll do that first half a day, 9:30 a.m. to 1:30 p.m. Sports media convergence. Um, we haven't haven't locked in the times and, and presentations yet. Two to five o'clock, we will do sports book festival at the local independent bookstore, Bookmarks. Seven authors signing, including Seth Wickersham, who wrote our sports book of the year. Uh, it's better to be feared. Bob Ryan, our hall of famer, has a new book out called In Scoring Position. Great idea. He, he goes, He's a season ticket holder of the aforementioned Boston Red Sox and has gone to tons of minor league games. He brings a scorebook with him to every game he goes to. So they pulled some of the pages out of this book, different games, and told the story of the game. I can't wait to read it. Um, Seth Wickersham's bringing his close buddy, uh, Wright Thompson, one of the best sports writers, in my opinion, working today. He's going to um, sign his book, Pappy Land, which is about bourbon. Um, I don't think who else. Uh, Bob Glauber covers the NFL for Newsday in New York. Forgotten First, which is the breaking of the color barrier in the NFL. He co-wrote that with Keyshawn John. Uh, Paul Keels, who is the play-by-play -play guy for Ohio State, wrote a kid's book about Brutus the Buckeye. So that's that'll be great for kids. What a great way to, to learn how to love reading if you don't love reading is read a sports book, right? And then Bethany Bradshaw, who's from Eastern North Carolina, is going to bring two of her books to sign. Hoping I didn't leave any. So that's two to five o'clock on Sunday, and that's free and open to the public. Uh, Sunday night is Legacy Night, so we're giving the Ruth Arledge Award for Innovation to Jane Kennedy, the first woman of color to appear on a network television sports show in um, NFL Today, back at CBS, in '78 through '80. Uh, and then give our four new awards as well. And then after party that night, then Monday, we'll have a full day of the Sports Media Convergence Summit from nine to four. Then we will do our receptions, awards receptions and the awards banquet at Benton Convention Center in downtown Winston-Salem. If you have any inkling that you might wanna be in sports media, it is the place to be, because as I said, I don't believe there is any other gathering with this many sports media people in one place where they're not working. So uh, I can't wait. We'll have a lot of work to do before we get there, but uh, it's funny, you do all this work all year and then all of a sudden in three days it's over. And my biggest regret is not getting to talk to all of the people who come to town for any good length of time. I try to at least talk to everybody uh, a little bit, but. Uh, I guess that's the but I get to know them and then I can continue the conversation. The best part about having all these winners come to Winston-Salem is they become best friends. They become contacts that I can use to hook up those young people who are either trying to get in or they got their first job in Milwaukee. And I know tons of people in Milwaukee now because of this job. That that just sounds phenomenal. And I, yeah, it, it really is a no brainer. <laughs> National sports media.org. If you're interested. Yeah, that's, that's a no brainer. Before I let you get out of here, your thoughts on the future of the industry. Well, my people think, I've often been asked, you know, where do you see this industry in five years? And my honest answer is I have no idea. <laughs> it has changed so fast, so much, um, that you'd almost be foolish. I, I always joke that uh, be able to watch things on the inside of your eyelids. I'm thinking that's only half joking. 
because why not? Um, as, as technology changes, um, you know, I, I think the bad part has been the fragmentation of the audience, which has caused the financial losses, caused the upheaval in, in personnel. And you see people with lots of experience getting let go in favor of people who are young and fresh and cheaper. Um, that's that's just how it works. That's business. I don't know that uh, that will change. Um, I I do see a creeping in of cheerleaderism rather than journalism uh, in a lot of respects because of the types of media outlets that are now in the same space, bit journalistic outlets and I think the tendency is to see if those outlets get the clicks and the views and the numbers that you then feel like you have to go over be like that. And that I think can be dangerous. I think we see it on the news side. Probably more to the de detriment than the sports side. But it holds true in sports as well. I said that was going to be my last question, but you just clicked something. You didn't me. learn. You didn't learn in school. <laughs> that you never say this is the last one. Your thoughts on the screaming head sports shows. <laughs> um, I but, don't where, where, where are we going with these? Like, it's, do you see this as where it's going and we're just going to see more of it? Or does it have kind of a window of time and this is just the flavor of the month? To me, it's honestly, it's like podcasting. When people say, should I do a podcast? It's like, well, if you had started 10 years ago, I'd say you should keep with it. But if you're starting it now, you're going up against 30 million others who are starting this podcast. So unless you have really, really deep pockets or, or you just want to do it for fun, why, why are you doing it? Um, but in answer to that question, it's as many as ratings will support. Uh, I don't typically watch them. I don't have anything against them. I mean, there are people who I love who I will yell at while I'm watching them on TV. Um, you could probably guess who they are <laughs> and then that you know that's play by play that's color that's talking head shows whatever just the way it is it's you know when I, when a technology first changed so that anybody could put anything out there I'm, I've, i thought to myself wow isn't this great we will have citizen journalists you know the only problem is unlike you and me they're not trained in how to do it right. And so you get all the bad and the ugly with the good. And it's up to, in a capitalistic society, it's up to the consumer. Gotcha. Dave Gorn, Executive Director, National Sports Media Association, has a wonderful event that's going to go on at the end of June make sure you check out their website. I'll make sure to link to it down below. Thank you so much for joining Breaking News with Media Leaders today. It's been my pleasure, Keith. It's always great to see you, and uh, best of luck in, in your new gig as well at Syracuse. Thank you. Let's stay in touch. Will do. Hey, folks, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you get you got a lot out of the conversation. I will break down the video so that you will see various clips taken from it. Please make sure that you like and subscribe to the channel. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining us. Look at all those phone calls since we were on.